He's been paid to direct and produce Hawaii's number one local newscast, a groundbreaking kids show, and practically everything in between. Television producer-director Phil Arnone, coming up next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. When you think of a television director, especially one who's made his mark working on live broadcasts, you may picture someone who's confident, diligent, dedicated to perfection, and perhaps wound a little tight. Producer-director Phil Arnone was all that during his time with KGMB, by far Hawaii's number one television station in the 1970s and 1980s. Arnone's love for Hawaii is evident in the work he did then, and the work he's involved with now, telling the stories of the people and places of Hawaii. This producer, who has so carefully archived the lives of people such as Israel Kamakaviva Ole, Eddie Aikau, and Rap Replinger, began life an ocean away from Hawaii. You've spent a lot of time in the Bay Area growing up. Born and raised in San Francisco. My uh, father was uh, a second generation Italian and my mother was second generation Norwegian. And uh, as a result, of course, I speak no Italian or Norwegian and never have any food that isn't American. That was, <laughs> the, that was in an era where people that were born elsewhere and moved to America were such patriots immediately, and they didn't really want to talk about their history in the old country, if you will. My father was more outgoing and more Italian. I mean, he was, so he was uh, out there and friendly and reaching and uh, approachable, and my mother was a more conservative, quiet person, but uh, it was a good family life. We, we didn't stay in San Francisco too long. Uh, in the end of the sixth grade, moved to Marin County at the other end of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, Marin County, what was your life like as, as a child after sixth grade? Um, well, it was good. I mean, very, very normal. The, the town that we lived in, Corte Madera, was probably had, I don't know, 1,800 people living in it. It was quite small. And we walked to school. We had walked down a railroad track and then grammar school. So it was pretty normal for me. Phil Arnone led this normal life through high school, then on to college. In his search for what to do in his life, Arnone looked to the military, which in turn brought him to Hawaii. I started off uh, at a junior college, at uh, College of Marin in Kentfield, and uh, mostly looking for things to see if I, something I wanted to do. Uh, and I, <laughs> I didn't find any. At the time I tried uh, uh, forestry and civil engineering and uh, took class in all about religions and took a business class. Pretty much, I did okay in them, but it never turned me on, never excited me. Did you, did you think I'll have to get a job and not be ex especially excited, but I'll do it? Um, well, here's what I did. At the end of the two years, I joined the Army. Uh, actually, I volunteered for the draft. There was a draft then. So they just take your name and put it up on top, and boom, you're in the Army. And, uh, Why'd you do that? Because... Well, it was between wars, for one. I was... <laughs> it was safe? It was pretty safe, yeah. I, so I did that because uh, I needed a little experience living away from home and growing up and seeing how... how the, I failed the growing up part, but I <laughs> did get some experiences <laughs> living away from home. Where'd you go? Well, here's after all the basic training and then the next six week training or whatever, the, they said, well, Phil, it's time to, for you to go somewhere. You have a choice. You can go to Alaska or Hawaii. And I said, uh, after waiting a good two, three seconds, I'll go to Hawaii. I'm one of those guys that listened to Hawaii calls on the radio in California with, when I was growing up. And you know, they painted a, a wonderful picture and I, painted another one in my head, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is wonderful. So I was at Schofield Barracks for about a year and a half. We're talking about the late 50s, so. Soon after statehood. Uh, I mean, when I got off the plane for my first time here, it was on the other side of the airport, Lagoon Drive. You walk down to the stairs, there was no ramp coming out to you, and they give you the fresh pineapple juice, I mean, it lived up to what I'd heard, certainly, and I was, I loved it a lot. 
Did you get to know local people very much when you were at Schofield? No. I really didn't because I was at Schofield or I was at Waikiki. I might have met a few people locally at the beach, but not, not out at Schofield Barracks. So thanks to the U.S. Army, Phil Arnone was able to get that experience of living away from home in the place that he would later call home, Hawaii. But he still needed to find a career. He left the military and went back to San Francisco where he continued his college education. When it was time to get out, uh, After one, one hitch? Yeah, one hitch, which was really only a year and a half, and they let you out early if you were going to school. So I was going to go to San Francisco State, so they have a, a new uh, student orientation that you have to go to regardless of whether you're going as a freshman or a junior, as I was going into. And at the, and at the end of that, they said, well, now if you'll all stand up, it's time for you to go to your major advisor. I said, oh, major advisor, hmm, I wonder what that's going to be. <laughs> so I walked up to the, out of the auditorium and I looked up and the first sign on the left said radio TV. And I went, ah, oh, let's try that. Really? Yeah. Randomly? And I did. I walked in and uh, I loved the people, I loved the work, and I went, God, this is fun. I really like this. And I thought, well, maybe I'll be, a, I'll be in radio. That, that, I could do that. And then at one point, uh, there was a field trip to a television station where they were doing a local Dick Clark dance party kind of show. So I went in the control room and I watched the director standing up, listening to the music, calling the shots. I said, now I know what I want to do. Do you remember how many cameras the director oh, had? He had two. Only two, oh, okay. Hey, and black and white. And <laughs> there are turrets on the end. I mean, this is in the. Uh, what was it, the late 50s, early 60s? Yeah, it was the early 60s. So that was in San Francisco, CBS affiliate, and then I got a job there. But they don't just let you be a director at, all at once, right? Uh, no, I, I wasn't directing. I started in the film department uh, in, in that uh, as an editor, but in those days what that meant was they would, uh, all the movies were on uh, film, and you had to cut them to fit the commercials in. So you would either find, <laughs> without destroying the storyline. Did that for a while, and then I got uh, the job I wanted, which was to be a stage manager. So I was stage manager for the rest of my stay there. You were bringing people in and out to appear on programs? Well, yeah, you're, you're calling, the, you're cueing people to the, you know, it's like doing a newscast and you're on the floor and you're telling them when they're on and t counting them back from commercial. And Are you doing a lot of live television then? It was almost all live. I don't remember hardly ever taping anything. Dance party show that I saw earlier, I, I did direct some of those episodes. Despite directing a few episodes of the dance party show at KPIX in San Francisco, Phil Arnone was still considered a stage manager. Being a director was what he really wanted to do. So he moved back to Hawaii where he had no job lined up, no connections, and no knowledge of what the television industry was like here. And where he teamed up with a man who would become Hawaii's dominant television anchor of the 1970s. I came to Hawaii because I'd been here in the Army and thought, hey, maybe they'll have a job for me. So I would have, I would have thought your best job prospects would be in San Francisco. Well, they, they, they weren't. They weren't, okay. And, and Hawaii seemed nice. I mean, maybe it sounded, you know, when you're young, you do things that may not make a lot of sense sometimes, and maybe that was one of them. But uh, when I got here, uh, at least I had like three years of experience at the television station in San Francisco, so it looked like, I, hey, this kid knows something. He knows something about television. Did you know anything about the television industry here? No, not really. So what, what did you go about doing as well, soon as I went you arrived? Well, I went to all the stations and uh, left resumes, and uh, almost immediately I started working at uh, Channel 2, um, which was Kona then, I think, Kona TV. And I was doing a little uh, switching audio, camera stuff, uh, editing film things, things I wasn't actually terribly skilled at. <laughs> And then when a directing job opened up at Channel 4, 
I went over there, and I was there for three years. But then that's when I met Bob Seavey. He was the uh, the Pan Am news anchor. Bob was one of the guys that uh, I certainly learned a lot from. Um, just watching him work on camera, how he handled himself, and, and, and Bob was the same guy on camera or off camera. That's a, a wonderful man. He had this great gravitas that didn't get thrown off by untoward events that happened during newscasts, like a tripod falling down or somebody um, walking into the news into the studio, not being aware you're on live television. Yeah, he was. Uh, he, could, he could handle the worst situation. What did a director at that time do? Ah, the main thing that I did was uh, directed all of Bob Seavey's Pan American newscasts. Directing meaning I have a script in the control room uh, and I roll in, give the commands to roll in tape and when to go to it and when to go to this or that or whatever the graphic might be and go to commercial. So on your end, it, it wasn't just following a list of commands in, in your head or on the script. You sometimes tape comes in late or things happen and you have to, you're always on the fly as far as adjusting. And as, and when Bob CV is going to drop things, you, you make that happen, right? There's an energy that is created when you are delivering the news when you know it's live and you know it's just happening and everybody's breathing hard and excited. And, and you're waiting for the last information or the last film right. clip to come in? And will people come out and hand you a page of script or a new bulletin that's come in or somebody has just died that we need to talk about and all of that happens. So it can be very exciting. It can be very stressful. We try not to make it too stressful. The career that Phil Arnone had been working towards, that of a television director, had finally been realized. Arnone soon earned a reputation as a producer and director who accepted no less than perfection from himself and from the people with whom he worked. Well, so Bob Seavey picked you when he switched stations, I take it? He, uh, well, he was hired by Cease to run the news department and Within, it seemed like a couple of weeks, the director that Cease had hired had a heart attack in the news, in the control room, passed away. At Channel 9. At Channel 9. So um, Bob had suggested to Cease that uh, I could come over and do that job. You and I worked in the same television station in the Bob Seavey days. Yes. And you could be one of two things. You could be steely and scary. <laughs> or you could be staccato sharp and scary. Uh, but scary was pretty much the defining uh, approach. Yeah. I mean, you were, you were a no tolerance, perfection director. There are others who go, that's okay, no problem. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll make it back on this next show. You, no prisoners, take no prisoners. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well. Um, but you're right. I mean, I tried to have a perfect show, but I think every director would, wants that. It's not like they don't want it. But I, and and what you have to do is, if there's a mistake made that's on the air already and nothing you can do about it, so you need to talk to that person after the show about what happened. Yes, your 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 conversations with people <laughs> about this were are very memorable to them. <laughs> But well, sometimes I would open up the microphone from the control room that went into the newsroom on a PA system kind of thing and tell somebody right after they made a boo-boo that it wasn't nice, don't do that again, please. And a different choice of words, perhaps. Were you looking for something that would work because you wanted that perfect newscast? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that was the job. The job was, we don't want to see a lot of blank screen, a lot of things catching people unawares. We can't do that. so. Were you as hard on yourself when you made a mistake? I'd like to think so. I've changed. I've grown up a little bit. I, I realize that perhaps saying certain things doesn't really help you in the long run. 
Phil Arnone was in the right place at the right time. Under owner Cease Heftel, KGMB was the market powerhouse in local news and entertainment in the 1970s. In addition to directing the top-rated Channel 9 News, Arnone also produced and directed live coverage of local sporting events. He created the Hawaiian Moving Company. He produced and directed music specials that featured, amongst others, Cecilio and Capono, the Peter Moon Band, and Emma Veery. He directed 50th State Wrestling, working with Lord Tally Ho Bleers, gentleman Ed Francis, and handsome Johnny Berend. And there was also a kids show, one that even today is still very fondly remembered by many Hawaii residents. When I started, uh, the, the infamous Checkers and Pogo show was either just starting or about to start. And the show was successful almost from the very beginning because Cease was not, was looking for something that kids would want to watch, but um, but also advertisers would want to be in with kids' products. Did you direct the Checkers and Pogo uh, show? I'm, I may have directed an episode or two along the way, but I was more the producer. And uh, I do remember one of the infamous episodes where, you know, there's a lot of pie throwing in that show. When they were desperate for someone to hit with a pie, I would put on a coat and tie because it was much more fun to hit a guy with a pie if it was if he was dressed up, and they they uh, called me management, if you will. <laughs> so I would walk out there and demand that they give me that pie. I don't want to see it, of course. And the kids are screaming, "Yeah, give me a pie, okay? <laughs> hey, this is good. Watch this." A huge studio <laughs> audience. I, I I still run into adults who who are oh. now maybe collecting social security, and they <laughs> they just can't believe how much fun it was being on that live yeah. television show as a kid. There was the uh, the penny jar that they could stick their hand into. There were funny faces, I don't know if you remember that, but th that was a chance for kids to make a face and it was okay to do that. Different vibe. It was a station yeah. that kind of did what it wanted and was very successful at reading what the audience was willing and happy to watch at the time. As Cease had a, you know, free-for-all was a big part of what Cease did. Uh, it was on radio and television at the same time, which was giving away money. And uh, he always said, if you're giving away money, people will watch or, or listen to the radio. I mean, he went right to the base core, the, this, is, this will work. We're talking about the fun in the games and the money giveaway, but the newscasts were sacrosanct. Bob Seavey didn't tolerate any funny business. No, he didn't, and, but Cease totally kept his hands off the news department. He hired Bob, and the, Bob, Bob made the decisions about hiring people and what the newscast was going to look like and be like, and so um, Cease was certainly smart enough to realize that he can't be commanding every inch of this station, and Bob knows what he's doing. So. Yeah. And you did both. You could go crazy and you could go very serious. I was, yeah. Were you as um, intolerant of mistakes on the Checkers and Pogo show as you were on the news? Yeah, I, well, no, probably not to the same degree. I mean, the news is a serious show that, that needed to be handled in a certain way and look professional. You could look goofy and make a mistake on Checkers and Pogo. No one would know it was a mistake. <laughs> Just go, oh, that's fine. Get another pie ready. <laughs> While Phil Arnone's passion for television brought him professional success, he acknowledges that this same passion can consume you so that you sometimes forget the more important things, and he considers that a factor in the end of his first marriage. But sometimes work can also create social opportunities. Arnone met his current wife while he was producing a show at KGMB. That's an interesting story. We were uh, we were doing a bingo show for it was a short-lived, or is it lived? Short-lived show. It was an experiment. And Karen Kiavi Hawaii and uh, Kirk Matthews. Kirk Matthews were the two hosts. Uh, Michelle came down with a friend, a girlfriend, to watch the show. And I was looking at people on camera in the control room, and and there she was, and I went. I need to go out and talk to her. I think it's important. <laughs> you know, she's new in the studio, needs needs, needs friendly company. face, and 
that's that kind of stuff. So that, that was pretty much it. I don't think, you know, at the moment, okay, we kind of left it that way, and then I saw her at some other gathering, and uh, I think I got her phone number, but uh, we did go out on a date. We, I think we went to High's, where Michelle says I uh, interviewed her. <laughs> <laughs> I think she actually said third degree as opposed to interview, but um, she said <laughs> that was interesting. But anyway, that was the first date, and then we went on from there. So, I mean, I'm. Michelle is my best friend. Uh, I can talk to her about anything, and vice versa, and uh, she's a joy. I'm, uh, I'm so lucky. Uh, to have her in my life, I really am. And you have a, a blended family, although the, the kids mm -hmm. didn't grow up together, right? No, because there's yeah the age difference is uh, considerable. But uh, um, yeah, the the two daughters, um, Michelle's daughters and my daughters, obviously, uh, were we're all happy. About, we don't spend a lot of time with all together because people are living all over the country. But uh, you know, her daughter is, um, as I think I mentioned, they're, they're really very bright kids and have done well for themselves. Um, and, uh, and Tony is, uh, my son is a professor at uh, University of Iowa, a cellist, and has a couple of, a couple of CDs out, actually. In 1989, after working in Hawaii for 26 years, Phil Arnone returned to the Bay Area. As director of local programming at KTVU, he was working in a major market with major budgets. He was in charge of shows for San Francisco 49ers football and Giants baseball, as well as live coverage of local cultural events, such as San Francisco's Chinese New Year Parade. He produced the Orange Bowl Parade for CBS television. Arnone's career was soaring. But in 2002, it was time to come home to Hawaii. How'd you know it was time? Uh, well, let's see, I was turning 65, and um, I kind of pr promised my wife that we would come back at that point, and it was fine. I had no idea what I was gonna do when I got back. Didn't know what... Uh, you, was, did uh, you consider retiring? Well, I thought I was retiring. I, th I thought that's what it was happening to me on the plane back. And I thought, you know, yeah, I love this. I don't know anything else. Uh, was that a good move? Mm. But it turned out to be a great move. Rather than retiring, Phil Arnone continued to combine his talents as a producer and director with his love for Hawaii, producing specials about the people and places of our islands. That is what you found to do in quote retirement how did that happen <laughs> you're doing you're doing film after film after film for Hawaii News Now local programming well it, it started when I when I came back I went around and visited all the stations to see what was going on and as I got into KGMB uh, realized that this was in fact their 50th anniversary of being on the air so when talking to the general managers and she said well why don't you do this 50th anniversary show for us? And so that's how it started. Then we went from there to another show and another show and another show. And the, the truth is that I've learned so much about Hawaii and about these people and about the culture uh, that I never learned when I was here working at KGMB. I mean, I, we never did shows like this and I never left that station. I was always in the station doing things. I feel almost like, uh, Lou Gehrig when he said I'm the luckiest man alive because I'm still doing something that I enjoy and at, uh, at this age and this time. Don Ho, Tom Moffat, Duke Hanamoku, Dave Shoji, Jim Neighbors, Kapilani Park, Romance in Hawaii. These are just a few of Hawaii's stories that have been told by Phil Ardoni and his team, writer Robert Pennebacher and editor Lawrence Pacheco. At the time of our conversation in the spring of 2016, the 79-year-old Arnone and his team were working on their 20th film about the life of local jazz legend Jimmy Borges. Mahalo to Phil Arnone of Portlock in East Honolulu for sharing your story with us, and thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha hui ho.
For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. I did commercials for a while uh, in the 70s. It was on on camera kind of Were stuff. you the earnest pitch man? I was. I was very, well, I wasn't pitching it, but I was very serious in how I, except the McDonald's spot. They don't call me fast talking Phil for nothing. Grand prize, Datsun 280Z in either the two or four seat model. 30 all expense paid trips via United Airlines to Boston and Philadelphia. Other prizes, a console piano, a sailboat, an outrigger canoe, a refrigerator freezer, six color TVs, two electric typewriters, four stereo music systems, 20 calculators, four tape recorders, not bad so far, huh, folks? Four juice blenders, four wristwatches, four table fans, six vacuum cleaners, 10 digital clocks, 20 solid state radios, six pop-up toasters, 10 hair dryers, we're rolling now. 100 trail bike, three 10-speed bikes, two surfboards, two cassette tape recorders, 100 record albums, 